before we go into the actual conflict of the Korean War, let's try to get a, a sense of the, the historical environment going into the Korean War. So if you go all the way back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, the Korean Peninsula, what we now consider both North and South Korea, they were occupied by the Japanese military. And then in 1910, in 1910, the, the Korean Peninsula is formally annexed into the Japanese Empire. So the Japanese are essentially this colonial, this imperialist power here. And they stay in power in the, in the Korean Peninsula all the way until the end of World War II. And it's probably worth saying here, and it's probably worth making doing a bunch of videos here, that the, the Japanese occupation was not a pleasant occupation for the Korean people. They subjugated the Korean people in multiple ways, forced labor, forced prostitution. Uh, uh, they tried to kind of eradicate the Korean language and the Korean culture. So this was not in any way a, a pleasant occupation. They weren't pleasant imperialists. But you fast forward all the way to 1945, we know that Japan loses World War II. And the major two uh, victors on the Allied side that are kind of acting in th this part of the world are the United States and the Soviet Union. And so 1945, you have the Soviets coming from above. You have the Soviets coming from above. That's the Soviets coming from above. And eventually, you have the Americans coming from below. They occupy Japan first, so this is the USA. And they essentially, remember at this point, even though this is kind of the beginning of the Cold War, at this point in World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union are allies. And so the United States kind of tells the Soviet Union, hey, why don't we just stop at the 38th parallel? Why don't we just stop at the 38th parallel? And the United States actually didn't even think that the Soviets would stop there, but they actually did. And from the Soviets' point of view, it's believed that they stopped there because the United States didn't get there at the same time. So there was no one to stop them from going further south. But it's believed that the Soviets wanted to uphold their side of the agreement so that they could get, um, you know, so that they would be a trusted party to negotiations in Europe and maybe get more uh, in Europe, which is what the Soviets maybe cared about more. So what happens after World War II is that. The North, what's now North Korea essentially, becomes under the influence of the Soviets. Everything below the 38th parallel becomes under the influence of the United States. The Soviets essentially install this gentleman right over here to lead North Korea. Kim Il-sung, or the part of Korea that is north of the 38th parallel. At this point, this was just kind of viewed as a point where the Soviets and the United States should kind of meet up, where they would have to stop. It wasn't meant to be an actual partition of the country, but as we'll see, it actually becomes a partition of the country. But the Soviets install Kim Il-sung. He sets up a communist, essentially a communist dictator, uh, dictatorship in the north. And this is the current leader of North Korea's dad. This is Kim Jong-il's dad. So he gets installed in the north. and in the South, if you fast forward a little bit to 1948, there is an attempt at elections, but those, attempt, those elections are seriously rigged. And this gentleman, Sigmund Rhee, comes to power. And although he might look like a nice, pleasant man, he was actually fairly ruthless. And he is you know, unanimously considered a strong man. And on both sides of this, so once again, this is one of those situations where you really can't call either of these guys good guys, because both of them uh, are, are are, have have done some pretty uh, nasty nasty things to uh, each other to to soldiers on either side and and uh, to, to innocent civilians. But Syngman Rhee comes to power in the South, and his I guess most attractive feature to the Americans is that he is not is that he is not a communist. And so you have this situation setting up communist North above 38th parallel. Non-communist South, controlled by Sigmund Rhee, supported by the United States. The other thing that happens is that the Soviets help build up the North Korean military. The United States is not as encouraging of a strong South Korean military. So you start having a, uh, an imbalance between the military of the North and the South. And obviously, either one of these parties Kim Il-sung wants to unite Korea under his rule, under his communist rule. Sing Min Rhee wants to, wants to unite Korea under his authoritarian rule. So they're both kind of sending, setting up troops. They're both setting up troops along the border. And this whole time, this whole time, you have skirmishes going on across the border. And just to give you a context, you're probably saying, wait, Korea is you know, right next to China. What was going on there? And if you go to China you, you, in 1949, 
the communists come to power. There was a civil war leading up to that between the communists led by Mao Zedong and the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek. Mao Zedong comes to power. He wants to support the, the communists in North Korea, especially because some of those communists in North Korea actually help, helped, fight the, helped fight on the communist side during the Chinese Civil War. So this is an important factor right here. Mao Zedong is interested in spreading communism. He doesn't like the Americans in South Korea. And he feels some type of allegiance to the communists in North Korea. So now you fast forward to June 25th, 1950. And in the North, you have a major There's a lot. Uh, the, North, the, the North Korean army, and it's not called North Korea at this point. They both consider themselves Korea, competing, I guess, governments of Korea. The, the army in the North is disproportionately stronger than the South, and so they invade. They view this as their chance at unifying the peninsula. And essentially, they're able to almost just kind of storm through the Korean peninsula. Uh, immediately when that happens, the UN, and especially the United States, and this is because at this point the Soviet Union was boycotting the Security Council, so they couldn't even veto it. The UN immediately su starts supp supplying naval and, and air support for the South Koreans. But regard the, the disparity is so big that the North Koreans are able to just keep marching keep marching forward. Within a few days, literally by July 1st, the United States descends, uh, decides to commit ground forces, because we had substantial ground forces in Japan, which isn't that far away. Just to give you a global perspective, this is the Korean Peninsula right here, and this is Japan. I know I could have probably found a bigger picture of that. But America had military forces in Japan that they could send. And so the, the Americans enter the force in a, in, enter the battle in a major way very early on. But that doesn't stop the, the North Koreans for some time. So the North Koreans get all the way. They're able to occupy all of the Korean peninsula except for kind of the northeastern corner. So they get, they get around this far. And so over here you have the city of Pusan. And this is called the Pusan perimeter. Pusan perimeter. And it's at the Pusan perimeter that you have a little bit of a, of a uh, the, the United States and Korean forces combined are able to halt the North Koreans. And you have a kind of a, a slight stalemate for a couple of months here. But that while that stalemate is happening, the United States is able to, and especially the UN, but it's mainly the United States, is able to build up significant troops within, within the Pusan perimeter. But even more, and at this point, and at this point, the United States uh, or, or, and the UN forces go under the control of Douglas MacArthur, General Douglas MacArthur, who's a bit of an interesting character. Until this point, he was able to kind of rule uh, Japan with an iron fist. He's a, a hugely popular war hero in America. And the current president, Truman, kind of has a little trouble controlling uh, MacArthur, especially during the Korean War. And we'll see that MacArthur really oversteps his bounds during the course of this war. Now at this point, you have the South Koreans and the Americans kind of cornered out down here inside of the Pusan perimeter. It looks like North Korea is on the verge of victory, but the US is able to build forces. And the Korean War really just starts becoming into a, a game of risk. I don't know if you've ever played the game of risk, but whenever it's somebody's turn, they're able to spread their forces, but then they get spread thin, and then the other side's able to come back. And we'll see as the rest of the Korean War is essentially a back and forth between uh, the communists in the north, supported by the Chinese, although the Chinese aren't aren't in the war officially just yet, and then the, the Americans in the South. And the first really smart thing that MacArthur does is he says, look, instead of trying to fight our way uh, through the Korean forces that are over here, instead of trying to fight our way through all of these Korean forces that are over here, why don't we just kind of outflank them? And why don't we use our, naval, our Navy to do an amphibious landing of an army at Incheon? So in September 15th, while you have kind of the stalemate over here, the United States, they have an amphibious landing. So they send troops from all of these places. They have an amphibious landing at Incheon, which is near Seoul. So they land right over. They land at Incheon, which is roughly over there. I'm not super accurate here. And what's interesting about that is, in any battle, 
All of these Korean troops right here, they have supply chains. They have to get food and supplies and fresh troops from up here. And so the further in you go into enemy territory, the more spread out your troops get. And the strategy here is, instead of fighting through this, what if we outflank them and are able to land a significant force right here and immediately disrupt the supply lines of the North Koreans? And that's, exact, that's essentially what the Americans did. And it was successful. So MacArthur looks like a genius over here, and he's able to retake Seoul. He's able to take the what's kind of the North Korean capital at this point, Pyongyang, and you have the Americans marching north. So all of a sudden, it started off with the North Koreans being able to roll down, and now all of a sudden, the Americans and the South Koreans are able to roll up, and they're feeling pretty good about themselves. And the whole time, Truman's trying to keep MacArthur under check. MacArthur's excited. He's ultra confident. He thinks that the, the troops are going to be home by Christmas. He doesn't think China is serious about, about uh, supporting the North Koreans. And even more, he almost, it seems like, wants to pick a fight with China because he wants to uh, maybe, maybe uh, eliminate communism in China as well. He viewed it as, you know, he's kind of on this mission to eliminate communism from all of Asia. So Truman is saying, limited war. Don't cross the Yalu River and 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 be careful. Don't don't you know? Don't start attacking Chinese up here and enrage them. And and you're going to have them you know enter the war. MacArthur is it doesn't take that too seriously. And he also says, look, I have to start bombing bombs across the Yalu River so that the Chinese won't be able to send won't be able to send troops and supplies to to aid the North Koreans. So he's marching up all confident, going up against the Yalu River. And this whole time. The Chinese under Mao Zedong, under Mao Zedong, are sending a pretty substantial army, and they're able to do it secretly. They're able to march at night, and they even have these policies where if any surveillance planes go overhead, all of the Chinese soldiers have to freeze, and if they don't freeze, uh, someone else is allowed to shoot them, so everyone wants to freeze so that no one can really see them from above. So it's this really kind of a, a secret buildup of troops across the Yalu River, and this whole time MacArthur is just ultra, ultra confident about what's happening over here. But then you fast forward until the end of October, the Americans think that they're on the verge of winning the Korean War, and all of a sudden you have the Chinese cross the Yalu River, and the, the Americans didn't even know that the Chinese had major forces ready to cross. So now you have the, and once again, it's just like a game of risk. So now you have the Chinese cross, they catch the Americans unsuspected, they engage a few times, the Americans weren't sure if the Chinese were serious, so they keep re-engaging them, but then it becomes clear, yes, the Chinese are serious, the Chinese are serious, and essentially the Chinese are able to push back the Americans and the South Koreans all the way back so that they're able to recapture Seoul. But once again, like any game of risk, now the Chinese are spread thin. The the Americans and the South Koreans and all the other UN forces, although the UN forces are mainly the Americans, are able to regroup are able to regroup. And then in March, so Seoul has changed hands four times. So in March, they're able to retake Seoul again. They're able to retake Seoul again. And at this point, MacArthur, you know, ultra confident, he's telling the Chinese, you've essentially lost. He's even trying to get permissions to use nuclear weapons against the Chinese. He, To some degree, he doesn't even think he needs the permission of, of Truman to stop. It, it sounds like he's eager to push the Chinese further back, even though they kind of surprised him the first go around. So Truman has enough of this of this wild card guy who you know thinks that he can call the shots and use nuclear weapons if he wants to willy nilly. And so Truman finally dismisses MacArthur in April in April of 1951. And at this point, you start having a stalemate. You have you start having a stalemate near the 38th parallel. So that you start having a stalemate across this border right over there. And both sides think the end of the war is imminent. They're like, okay, we're back to where we both began. We should both stop here. But the negotiations unfortunately took over two years, and there's a lot of, um, uh, I guess, back and forth about what to do with prisoners of war and all of the rest. But it finally took two years, so that in July 20, July 27th, 1953, you have an armistice signed uh, between the two parties. And I want to make it clear, an armistice, uh, an, an armistice agreement, it is not a peace treaty. It is not saying that we both agree that this is the border of our two new countries and that we are now at peace with each other. All an armistice means is that we're going to stop fighting. 
It is not a formal end to the war. So in theory, in theory, North and South Korea, even to this day, are in a state of war. And you know, to this day, I'm recording this video in 2011. Maybe if you view this in the future, hopefully they won't be in an official state of war. But they're in an official state of war under an armistice. They've just agreed. They've just agreed to stop fighting. So. All in all, you have this hugely bloody battle with all of these atrocities going on on both sides. You know, Sing Min Rhee, when he was the first time when the North Korean troops were rolling into South Korea, he essentially beforehand he was he was kind of imprisoning a bunch of people who he suspected to be communists. And when he said, when I'm talking about people, I'm talking about whole families uh, sometimes. And when he was retreating, he essentially allowed the massacre of a, of a huge number of people who were just suspected of being communists. And you know these weren't just uh, military men. These were women. These were children. These were entire families. So he's guilty of that. And Kim Il-sung, just as guilty when, when the North Korean soldiers infiltrated uh, the South Korea and Seoul. They committed atrocities, killing uh, 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 civil servants, killing uh, uh, any of the kind of established intellectuals in the area. So on both sides, this hugely horrific war. And just to get a sense of what was happening. You know, Korea isn't a huge country, but you have within Korea the civilian debts, 1.5 to 3 million civilian debts and the consensus is at 2 million. And you know, this tells you how ugly war is, is that you can't even estimate how many people died to the nearest, you know, 500,000 people. You you just don't know what happened, but 2 million people died in a country that's not too big. You have 30, you know, all in all, you have about 40,000 uh, American soldiers dying. China, China loses on the order of, depending on the estimates, 400,000 soldiers. I mean, the estimates are all over the place. North Korea loses uh, on the order same magnitude of soldiers. South Korea loses, you know, several hundred thousand uh, of, of soldiers. So you have this hugely bloody battle, this hugely bloody war, I should say, that really ends with a an outcome that wasn't so different from where.